Okay, uh, it's, uh, welcome everyone to our October uh, Canandaigua Lake TU meeting. Uh, we've got, uh, well, let's see, 18 folks so far have signed in and they've been uh, beeping in as we, we speak here. So uh, we should have a, a pretty good crowd here tonight. Um, and uh, I'm uh, Gordon Mueller, I'm the uh, chapter president of uh, Canandaigua Lake TU and uh, thank you for uh, everyone who's uh, joined us tonight from various places. And uh, we should have a pretty good uh, talk. We've actually kind of gotten a little jump start on it uh, with our guest speaker. And uh, so uh, without uh, further ado, let me uh, run through our, uh, our program tonight. Um, uh, we'll do our usual uh, kind of business updates and uh, conservation updates, and then um, get that out of the way on 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, we'll get to the main event tonight which is fishing the salmon river for various species with our, our good friend uh, rocky rockwell uh who if you've uh, been joining he's been the one get, talking about the salmon river already so he's a fount of information about the the river um so uh always like to start our meeting with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So uh, if you have a hat, please remove it. If not, uh, just uh, please join me in reciting the pledge. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation under God, under God uh, indivisible, indivisible with with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Amen. Okay. I always like... Uh, I like this one of my favorite pictures of the flag of a tragic event though. That was... Okay, uh, just a couple of quick photos uh, people have shared with us in the past month. Uh, here's a couple of uh, inland brown trout. Uh, Al uh, Krauss caught the one on the left there from the Delaware. And um, this is one of uh, Scott's clients or friends. Uh, I'm not sure where he got this little guy, but uh, nice to see a young person getting into fishing here too and uh i've still been pan fishing bass fishing so those they're still been biting pretty hard uh real colorful one on the left there uh real nice one there it was about a saucer sized uh sunny i got there and then um my friend uh john gawkey who guides in the finger lakes <laughs> staffed this picture for one of his trips of a rather uh, greedy smallmouth bass they had to <laughs> rescue and uh and uh, pull the bait out of his mouth there. So um, sometimes they literally bite off more than they can chew. So that's what they had to actually had to do some surgery to get that. Uh, I think it was a sun or a perch. He said that that uh, bass had stuck in his mouth there. And um, here's some fish uh, from what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, uh, there's a uh, king salmon on the left. Um, we got off our Facebook page. And then um, on the right there, that's a brown trout also from the Salmon River that um, uh, Scott Feltrinelli and I were fishing it actually it was a week ago. And um, so um, we'll hear more about them, but there are people, we're getting a lot of reports of uh, big brown trout in the, in the salmon this year. And they should start uh, in our area, I would think pretty soon too. And um, Scott shared this with me also, in fact, there he is. Um, and um, so uh, this was a, an award, a photo award, uh, and this was a 22-inch brown trout he caught in Cataraugus Creek, and um, you can submit photos to the DEC and a fish you've caught and released, and uh, they sent him this nice little pin, so and apparently he caught that on a three-weight. Uh, uh, just real quickly, uh, we're uh, up to uh, 238 members now, and uh, so we've got we've got a big bump in my membership um, when the uh, we absorb the uh, members from the Conhocton Valley chapter south of us. Um, so, which also expanded our territory south uh, in the Conhocton Valley, and so we now go officially as far south as uh, the village of Bath and a little bit east too. I think uh, we picked up uh, Hammondsport and, and that area. So uh, um, 
quite a territory we have, a lot of water in our territory. Actually, five of the uh, Finger Lakes are in the territory of, uh, our, of our chapter, all the little lakes. Um, and uh, we have uh, 328 Facebook members. And um, if you use Facebook, it's a good place to brag about your catch and put pictures there. And um, we also put our newsletter up on that. And, uh, and then our newest tech is our uh, YouTube channel. We're actually recording this meeting. And afterwards, um, for people that can't make the meetings, uh, you can actually go to our YouTube channel. And we've been doing this since February and, uh, and uh, watch um, uh, some of our previous meetings. The one we did last May, which was a, a really excellent meeting we did on the Cahocton River. Uh, has actually been viewed quite a few times. I think over 50 times I looked the other day. Um, okay. So what's uh, coming up in the future, our November meeting, I'm really excited about. Um, I had a gentleman um, uh, approach me from a, a lodge in uh, Manitoba, Canada called uh, God's River Lodge, which is a uh, kind of an auspicious name to give a place, but it looks like it, it, uh, the name of the river and the lake it's on uh, fits it. It's uh, 300 and some miles north of Winnipeg. And uh, they're offering a, uh, uh, some special uh, packages uh, to, for uh, July, uh -huh. August, and September. And um, so uh, they're going to be our guest speaker in November. I've already started uh, working with this gentleman. It looks like a, a really good deal, and I may actually you know, want to take this up on it myself. There's a uh, a large lake there they call uh, God's Lake, and uh, which is known as a uh, walleye and uh, lake trout <coughs> and, um, and pike fishery. But there's a river that tributary for the lake that's uh, has just enormous brook trout in it, and that's what. Uh, uh, this fellow is holding here. So um, that's not a Photoshop, that's a real brook trout. So it's one of those uh, Canadian uh, fisheries that just has these, you know, huge northern um, strains of uh, brook trout in. So that should be a good one. Don't miss that meeting. Um, uh, December, we'll have a holiday party of some sort, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that in person. We're watching the uh, positivity um, rates very carefully. And once that gets down low enough, uh, we'll be able to get back together in person at the American Legion Hall. And um, so that'll be December 13th. And then in January 10th, uh, we just finalized our uh, speaker, uh, Kirk Klingensmith from uh, uh, Corning is um, going to uh, be our guest speaker. And uh, this will be a good one for all you snowbirds out there because he's going to focus on fly fishing in Florida where he uh, winters uh, quite a bit and um, has done a lot of fishing. So that'll be a, should be a good program too. And um, our February speaker is also now uh, locked in a gentleman from Caledonia, Bob Herson, who's a big fly tire, uh, uh, flies, uh, ties a lot of flies for uh, different shops and things and calls himself a Bohemian fly fisher. He lives right on the banks of uh, Spring Brook. Um, in March, uh, Tim Flagler will be joining us uh, virtually, but uh, that we're looking forward to do some fly tying. Uh, in April, we actually are looking for a guest speaker. So if anyone has any ideas or wants to volunteer and uh, give me a shout and uh, we'll, um, we'll set you up. We have a couple of possibilities for our, um, our April um, meeting. And then um, in May, uh, we're going to um, do our intro to fly fishing school at Onanda Park on the uh, shore of Canandaigua Lake. And that'll also be our, our May event, our May meeting uh, too. So um, uh, stay tuned there. And also, if you'd like to uh, volunteer to help out at the school, uh, please let me know. That's a Saturday, May 14th. And then in June, uh, we always like to have a kind of an end of the season picnic. And um, we're going to also resurrect uh, what we call our one fly challenge. And we'll hold a picnic on the um, Cohocton River at the uh, uh, what they used to call the special regs parking area, which is kind of off the main highway, but a really good place to fish and it actually has a big parking area. And so that's also uh, Saturday, June 11th. And 
we'll have more details later. And then the final event of the season will be our, uh, our bass and pan fishing event at Bowton Park in, um, in East Bloomfield. We're gonna, we got permission to do that again this year. So uh, that was a lot of fun this, this past year. So that's what's coming up uh, this season. And um, if anyone has any questions or, or anything, uh, just let me know and um, uh, you know, send me a chat or, or an email. Okay, uh, we're always uh, looking for volunteers. We actually have uh, two vacancies on our board of directors. Uh, Jerry, Mecca, and Ralph are, have finished their uh, tour of duty on our board. And um, so I want to thank them for all the, the help they've been. Ralph is actually the uh, person who's responsible for getting uh, Rocky to our, uh, as our guest speaker a couple of times here. So thank him for, for that and, and uh, his uh, connection with uh, Tim Flagler. And um, so we're always looking for um, uh, volunteers for other things uh, to help with the newsletter or uh, even just sending us photos. Whatever you can, we're a volunteer organization. So uh, um, the efforts of our volunteers are where it keeps the, uh, the lights on and, the, and these programs going. So um, email uh, us if you do want to help out at all at uh, info at Canadagua Lake tu.org. Um, and let's see, anything else here? Uh, Al, let me put you on and uh, give us an update on our conservation projects. I know we had some some news there. I guess so, Al here. Yep, yeah, he's there. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Okay. Well, I just want to let, uh, for we got quite a few folks online. I don't know how many, we may have some guests, so I'll just uh, kind of cover, review the situation a little bit. But uh, for uh, 2021, uh, we have an Embrace the Stream project. Uh, we call it the Crossroad Project. And uh, Early in the year, we went out there and we cleared some paths and we dropped some trees and we trimmed some trees and we marked out where we were going to put uh, nine habitat improvement structures. But then uh, Mother Nature kind of did us in a little bit. I think most of you realize that uh, this summer has been a lot wetter than normal and our permit requires that we uh, put our structures in uh, during a low uh, water level period. One of the biggest reasons is so we minim minimized uh, the turbidity that we put into the river and not adversely affect uh, the trout in the river and other uh, creatures in the river. <clears throat> but unfortunately, uh, like I said, uh, rainfall has been uh, well above uh, normal. We were scheduled to uh, put in the structures uh, middle of July, but the water was too high. And then we rescheduled for September, and the water really got high. Usually, if you look at the historical data, the Cockton River really drops down from September all the way to the beginning of October. But this year, <clears throat> instead of stepping down, uh, throughout that entire, entire period, it kind of stepped up. And if you looked at the news like tonight, uh, Steuben County down there where the Cahokton is located was declared a federal flood disaster area. So not only did we have high water, but the our partner, Steuben County Soil and Water Conservation District, had to take their heavy equipment and use it to fight floods and, and rebuild some flood control structures. So, so we had to cancel out again in September. Um, we were looking at trying to <clears throat> maybe try to do something in October, but there's, they're still doing their flood uh, reconstruction work. So we cannot get the equipment and our, we got a permit extended to uh, 15 October 
but uh, we're just not going to be able to get the equipment. So we're going to have to uh, try to put these structures in as early as we can uh, in 2022. The way the Embrace the STEAM program works is we have two years uh, to complete the project. I had wanted to put the uh, structures in this year and then do planting next year. Now we're going to have to try to put the structures in next year and and also do the planning right on top of that. So, so unfortunately, uh, things just didn't work out the way we want them. Um, and that's, that's all the update I got. All right, well, thanks. That's, uh, yeah, it was a wet year, that's for sure. We did, uh, especially in August, I think it was, we got so much rain there, but. What's the flow in the Cahocton, Al? Uh, so I had an inquiry today about the, I haven't checked it the last couple of days, but the last time I checked it, it was up to like about two nine at Avoca. So that's above our our threshold for doing the project. And then the other thing is uh, they're still working on rebuilding those projects. But last I checked, it was about uh, two nine. Okay. It's it's running, Gordon. It's running at one hundred fifty five cfs. And it is uh, 2.78. Uh, but the other thing I think we're running into is is spawning for the brown trout in the fall. Yeah, our pro we had to our permit was only good until one October, and we were able to get it <laughs> extended to 15 October. But we we can't go any further because of of the spawning and so on. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense there. So. All right, great. Well, thank you, Al. Um, well, not great, advice. but that's the best we can do. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, go with the flow here. So, okay, uh, let's see. Will, are you on? Uh, do we have any updates on healing waters or? Uh, no, we don't. We're still on hold because of COVID and uh, the. Um, the um, construction at the VA. Okay. All right, let's hope that uh, we get news sometime about that, but thanks for uh, letting us know there. All right, so without uh, further ado, we're actually right on time here. Um, Ralph, do you wanna introduce uh, Rocky to us? And I know you. Yes, it's my uh, my pleasure pleasure and privilege to uh, to introduce Rocky. Um, you all have maybe heard this before, but he is a local native. Grew up in the uh, Corning area, went to SUNY Blackport, but most importantly, uh, Rocky spent his career in the Army, Special Forces, Ranger, uh, Master Parachute. He's jumped out of planes more times than you all have gone fishing. So, uh, number of overseas deployments, been in Iraq twice, and is uh, retired. He was lieutenant colonel, but given the army laws and regulations, he's a retired rank of major. But I will tell you, don't mess with this guy. I've got other stories to tell, which I'll pass on tonight. Go ahead. Um, Rocky's a guide. Uh, he's a history lecturer. He he uh, he does a series of lectures on black soldiers in the Civil War and black military history of the Revolutionary and Korean War. Uh, as he will do tonight, he's going to talk about uh, fishing and environmental things. Uh, last time he talked to us about landlocked at, uh, at Atlantic salmon in uh, on the Salmon River. He's, he can talk about seasons on the Salmon River, which I think we will get into that tonight. And he and I have spent many long times talking about uh, what's happened in the Great Lakes over the last 300 years. He's a New York State guide. Uh, he's a Douglas and Salmon Run approved guide. And he works with wounded warriors and many military personnel. Go ahead. Uh, I refer to Rocky as a buddy and a friend. Um, he's a teacher and instructor. <laughs> he's a cigar ambassador. You never find him without one. 
In fact, uh, if you if you're downwind from him, you'll know where he is. Um, <laughs> He makes lots of waiting staffs for folks, uh, which I'm a proud owner of a couple of them. He's, he's, uh, but he's not locked into fishing for cold water species. We've uh, spent many, many times uh, fishing for bass and, and other, other uh, various fish. Uh, and he's not wedded to the fly rod, although I think that's his, his favorite by far. Uh, a dedicated fly tire and lure maker, rod builder, and lastly, a very great friend. I'm glad to introduce Rocky to the, the Cannon Day will Lake to you. Okay, thanks, Ralph. And so let me uh, stop my share here and Rocky, go ahead and um, start yours up there. A couple of, couple of uh, things here. Uh, number one, I'm very appreciative of the invite. Thank you, Ralph, for coordinating. And uh, Ralph, how much I owe you Oh, you for that great introduction. <laughs> I'll, I'll email. I'll email you. Yeah, all right. All right, brother. All right. Let's just see. All right. This is a uh, what I want to emphasize, and I started this uh, presentation working on it a few years ago because people are uh, focused on salmon up here on the Salmon River, but we do have a year-round fishery now, and it's uh, developing very nicely. Okay. Ralph uh, wanted me to talk I'll about your fly. screen yet, Rocky. Did you share it yet, or? Did, oh, I didn't share it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I, I I can't find where to where to share it. I oh. There you go. Let me there. let me minimize. I think at the bottom there's a share screen button. Yeah, I can't hover. Yeah, there was, that. but I, I I I don't see anything on the bottom. I I got to take a health and wellness break thing here. <laughs> All right, let me let me no. just got to hover around the bottom. It should pop up on you. No, I, I just don't have it. And, uh, holy, I've got to explore our schedule of vir virtual fitness classes. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, that could be worse. <laughs> Did I, maybe I need to sign in again. No, 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 you're good. Um, yeah. What do you see on the bottom? Do you see mute? Mm. Uh, no, I have this contact us about this take a health and wellness we'll break. <laughs> we don't want to see that. All right, I'm closing <laughs> that. All right, here we go. Join meeting. And I'm going to the, yeah. No, you're in the meeting. I think I, I'm still in the meeting. Yep, yep, you're good there. All right, I'm going to the bottom and I don't see the share. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I got you. You're allowed to do that. On my screen, uh, share screen is a green, green icon. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have it. I'm in the uh, join from PC, Mac, iPad, and then join meeting. You should uh, go went back into the meeting and you'll see both of us, our smiling faces there. I think you might be on the wrong screen there. Uh, it's telling me to sign in again. Uh, where's the one that says Zoom meeting? That's where you want to be. It, it says Zoom, join, join the meeting, sign in. Uh, well, you're already in. What All else? Right. Jeez, I, I, I'm lost. I mean, Rocky, is there, a, is there a button that says view up in the upper right hand corner? So say what? Is there, a, is there something that says view up in the upper right hand corner? No. This is the message I got to uh, initially join the meeting. Okay. Do a uh, alt tab. Hold those two keys at the same time. <laughs> alt tab. Yeah, both at the same time. That'll show you what I'm, I'm looking for alt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for it earlier today. I didn't find it. 
Yeah, it should be in uh, one of your windows there. And just keep doing that until you, you get back. You're the on the keyboard, right? Yeah, on the keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for it. Gordon, why don't you go back to where we were with you and maybe he'll see it then and he can hit share screen. Okay. I can't even find alt. Oh, I got it. Uh, alt and what else? Alt and tab. Tab, okay. At the same time. That'll show you. Uh, what that that was that, there was something came up there. Let me. Let me know. You should see a picture of you smoking a cigar. And, uh... oh. That'll mean you're back in the meeting. Can you, see, can you see at the bottom of the screen it now says so I'm back. I've got, okay. I've got friend Rocky. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share. All right. Okay, now you should have that green button that says share. Your no, I'm, I'm back to uh, join meeting. Jeez. All right, I, I, I'm going to hit Alt Tab again, and there we go. I'm good. Okay. You guys got got the first slide? No. Huh? You should see your. I'm hitting. All right, that's good. Here we go. All right, is, is that being shared? Not yet. All right. It takes it a few seconds to hop in there. When you go to share, it'll show you all the windows you've got, and then you just pick the one that has yeah. your deck and, and click it and then start. There's a button on the bottom that says share. This is... <sighs> All right. There we go. All right. Okay. Is that up? There you go. Okay. All right. <laughs> Can I start now? I'm sorry. That's all right. We've all been there. All right. <laughs> I used to make a living doing this. So. As I said before, uh, we really do have a year-round fishery here, so I'm going to go go through the year. And the Ralph wanted flies, so there's a fly box for Ralph. <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, wanted to help his attitude and make him feel good about himself. All right, let's see. I'm working on the hand and eye coordination. Yeah. Okay. Now the friggin. I'm trying to change the slide. All right, here we go. All right, there we go. some more fly boxes. I put these in because these are the boxes I'm I'm carrying. Uh, the first box is salmon attractor patterns, and they're attractors. Uh, we all have confidence flies. These flies have all caught salmon at some time or another. I'm starting to use the uh, uh, the mop fly there, the steak and eggs, uh, quite a bit, but over time, that chartreuse works well for me. I always start with chartreuse early in the morning because it's a low light fly that they can see. And they're hitting out of aggression. There's, there's, they're not really feeding. Although that fish went to the lake as a, as a one inch fingerling and three years later, he's back as a 25 pound fish. So eating these deeply programmed into these fish. 
So, and I said before to some, one of the individuals that we uh, now know that when they crush an egg, which they're DNA programmed to do, because it helps ensure the success of their own progeny, that they can absorb some oils from that egg. In any event, that's the box I'm working out of most of. If I think there's steel or if I think somebody as see a steel head caught below me, I'll go to a natural uh, colored bugger. That's always worked good for me. Uh, if I'm going down by myself to the river to fish for salmon, I'll tie on a, a leech pattern first thing. And that's because I think it's, uh, the salmon will still hit it, but it's a great fly for the early uh, steelhead and brown trout. Uh, flesh flies come in when you start seeing a lot of carcasses on the river. Uh, we're not seeing a lot of salmon carcasses yet. We're not, very little spawning so far. Uh, but when they are, our carcasses in the river and those, uh, those carcasses are breaking down, the steelhead will definitely eat them. I don't tie the flesh fly, the standard rabbit flesh fly anymore. I tie these, uh, I tie it in a woolly bugger pattern and in the a, in a, in a flesh fly collars. And I think that I'm getting the same uh, presentation when I bounce it along the bottom as a standard flesh fly. But when that flesh fly comes off, off the bottom and swings at the end of your presentation, it doesn't work anymore. Well, the bugger can look like a leech or a, or a minnow. So I, I may be a little more efficient with that bugger. At least that's the thought, so. Okay, and I wanna emphasize that the Salmon River is more than this uh, Pacific Salmon Run. Uh, here's some fish uh, caught uh, in the river. This is, these fish are all caught in the middle section, Sycamore Pool. That's a nice large king there on the, on the left. This is yesterday's king. I had a young man uh, with, a, uh, with a little handicap and uh, you can see that chartreuse fly right in, right in the mouth. That was probably a 24, 25 pound salmon. And of course the cohos, we're always looking for cohos because they're beautiful fish. And here, here's a special one. Uh, Ralph had his uh, son-in-law up years ago and they caught a coho about this size, 15, 18 pounds, totally black on top and totally red uh, from the mid, uh, from, from mid uh, body down. And it was a, like a straight line. I'd never seen anything like it. It was the most beautiful uh, coho I'd ever seen. So their colors do vary a little bit. Great fish though. We all know 12,000 years ago, the last Wisconsin ice sheet uh, traveled north. Uh, it was not Lake Ontario then, it was Great Lake Iroquois. I put in this uh, yellow line to show what Lake Ontario looks like today. But you can see Great Lake Ontario was at least 100 feet higher. And it was, Oneida Lake was part of it, Cayuga Lake was part of it. Uh, that's how the landlocked salmon got in the Cayuga, got into a Seneca through the through the uh, system there. And uh, Fish Creek right here uh, goes out of the uh, Tug Hill. That was a uh, Atlantic uh, landlocked salmon stream when the first white settlers got here. At some point during that Wisconsin ice age, there was a block of ice uh, as that glacier retreated north, centered on what is now uh, Alex Bay. And that did block the uh, spawning of these landlocks. So the uh, fisheries people on both sides of the border did some studies with three or four uh, 1830 era landlocked salmon to see if they could determine if they were voluntary or if they were, uh, if that ice sheet was the reason they became landlocked. They think they were voluntary. And uh, it's probably true because they've done research on the West Coast and steelhead. Steelhead will make, uh, some of them will stay in the river system. If the water flow, water temp, uh, habitat and forage is such, they no longer need to make those long spawning runs. And a spawning run for Atlantic salmon from the Atlantic to Lake Ontario was 1,100 miles one way. All these river tributaries, to the St. Lawrence on both sides of the border had landlocked salmon and they have stocked some of these on both sides of the border. So I'm starting to hear reports from some of the rivers uh, uh, in New York. 
Don't hesitate to ask questions as I go through this because I'll learn as much as you will. Use the chat feature too, if you have a question too, so we can just kind of stack them up. All right. Uh, uh, here we go. All right. This is Lake Ontario today. You're all well familiar with that, but it was, like I say, it was much higher 12,000 years ago. Uh, the Tug Hill is a, is a very large forested area. It's the third largest forested, forested area in New York State. They estimate there's 4,000 miles of brook streams uh, on the Tug, and it's very heavily forested. It's very rural. There used to be a, a, a five communities on the Tug, uh, but uh, there was no rail transportation by the time the railroad got to the top of the Tug and 1875, those communities have uh, had, had all folded. So it's a, still a very rural area. And the brook trout are coming back. You've got to work for them. You got to, you got to walk a lot, but there, there are, are brook trout uh, up there. Okay. Uh, talking about brook trout, this is two weeks ago on, the, on Fish Creek. Uh, three of us fished for three hours. We caught 14 between 12 and 16 inches. All in all in vivid spawning colors and all on grasshopper patterns. But it was just spectacular hits on those grasshoppers. So uh, there's there's definitely areas up there to fish for the uh, for the native trout. And uh, so we have other creeks up there, Fish Creek, uh, North Branch and South Branch. We've got Mad River, but there's a lot of unnamed streams up there. If you want to trek. Uh, I put in Black River here because we're near that. And of course, the Oswego River is, only, is, is close. They're basically the uh, 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 same salmon run we have, uh, not quite as prolific. Uh, I always, as a guide, your first responsibility is safety. And a lot of guides really don't pay attention to that. So I never take a guest from the parking lot of the DSR unless they have cleats. Or a stud system. Uh, they, a waiter belt is mandatory. I have extra waiter belts with me. The waiting staff is optional, but uh, I know I need one. And sunglasses or safety glasses are, are required. And that's important. We had three instances of a hook pulling out of a king salmon this week and coming back and striking the individual. And I think all three probably got hit with the same velocity as a spent 22 bullet. Two guys got hit in the chest, and one guy got hit uh, one inch above the uh, above his mouth. And he he, there was only a superficial cut, but he had significant swelling. So when you've got one of those king salmon on, and you you've got a split shot on that uh, presentation, you you have to be careful because it will uh, it will ruin your day. A couple of the uh, swinging patterns we use. Uh, I'm not swinging for these kings right now. But uh, if the August fish you can swing for, they're, they're very aggressive and they will move. I think it was about five years ago, we had uh, tremendous salmon runs for two years straight, just tremendous. And we never took buggers or egg sucking leeches off when I was fishing salmon camp because we were hooking king salmon on the swing. And there was always a, a surface component to that. But right now it's the way they're running, it's very hard to get one swinging. Okay, we, the, the Pacific salmon become aggressive when they're up and they're getting ready to spawn. They're sorting out uh, uh, females and males and they're, they're looking for, they're building reds and then uh, they're, they're liable to snap a fly. Water levels and temps aren't as critical for salmon as they are for browns and, and, and uh, steelhead. These fish go through this amazing more, more metamorphosis in the lake from an apex predator to a spawning factory. And there's certainly a lot of factors we don't understand to the timing of that transition. But when that button goes off, their priority is to run, spawn, and die. And, and I've seen them come up in the river at 85 cubic feet per second. So uh, it really, uh, don't look at water levels aren't that important. The world's record coho comes out of the uh, Salmon River. I thought that was a great fact. Okay, uh, 
Rocky, I have a question in, sure. in the chat there. Uh, what yeah. are the patterns that you use when uh, swinging flies? I yeah, I tend to use the egg sucking leeches or the uh, or, or buggers. I used to use a lot of dark buggers, and and I know that fish see contrasting colors well, so I have more confidence in the in those uh, egg sucking leeches. And uh, we get here in the uh, the uh, presentation a little bit. I'm going to show you a bugger that I tie with uh, two colors in the tail that, that seems to be effective for me. So. Uh, with contrasting colors, we know the fish can see, 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 see that. I put in this uh, very large Pacific salmon here because that young lady caught it and she fought it for 40 minutes and she fought it hard. She didn't, that fish didn't rest. It didn't sneak into a soft hydraulic and regenerate. She fought it and she fought it. So she married this young man in New York City the next year, and they had the mount at their ceremony. I thought that was pretty cool. And I say, and this is something that is really important, and I really believe it's presentation over pattern. These fish are not striking because they're hungry and they're, they're focused on one food item. They're hitting because they're aggressive. They're hitting because they're pissed off. Something got in a foot of their of the, their nose, and they're going to snap at it or hit it. So your presentation you know, has got to be right down in front of their face. Uh, the tendency for most fishermen to come up here is to use too much lead. When we started fishing for these salmon years ago, the, the feeling was you had to tap, tap, tap on the bottom. Well, if you tap, tap on the bottom, you're overweighted. You're going to snag a lot. If I tap bottom once every two or three drifts, I know I'm in the zone and I'm not going to snag that much. So, uh, but again, presentation over pattern. Uh, yeah. Brock, yeah. Question. Yeah. Uh, do you ever, um, does anyone do uh, spay casting with uh, sinking lines in the salmon? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that you'll see a lot of that in uh, uh, um, uh, August, uh, late October when the steel had come up. A lot, you'll see the, the spay rods come out. I, I have a spay rod, but I don't use it because I think the switch rod is adequate for Salmon River. It's not a large river. And you fish it with a sinking, a heavy, a weight forward line that matches the rod in a various a size sink tip leader in a three foot uh, uh, tippet and uh, whatever pattern you want. A lot of guys use intruders. I, I use buggers, and uh, but it's a great way to catch them because you you know the tug is a drug. This uh, the the steelhead on the right is caught on a on one of those uh, uh, leech patterns, uh, egg sucking leech. The one on the left uh, uh, is an interesting fish. We had low water last year uh, when the steelhead started showing up in numbers and really low and really clear. So this, this young man, and I, he's a West Point grad. He got, we got together at night and he said, what are we gonna do? We didn't do very good today. We went to uh, small patterns and he, and he said, well, you know, let's, I haven't tried a San Juan worm. I said, well, you know, San Juan worms work this time of year as long as the water's over 40. So we tied some up with a bead and number 14 hooks. And that's what he caught that, that, that fish with. And I lost the biggest steelhead I've ever had on with that number 14 uh, uh, San Juan worm. So you have to be adaptable for these fish. Okay. We do have other fish up here. Of course, you have the, we talked about the steelhead. We have these domestic rainbow. And here's a beautiful, uh, beautiful one. I've seen them caught up to 15 pounds. They're called domestic rainbows because in the hatchery, they're bred to, to spawn in the, in the fall. They're a spring spawner, just like their, their first cousin, the steelhead, to spawn in the spring. But the, the DEC wanted a fish that, that would fill that niche in the, uh, in, in the fall, so they bred these domestics. Now, we caught a lot of domestics last year, but I understand now that, that they haven't stocked them for a while. So if you catch one, it's a naturally reproduced fish. This is last year's, this is a very, very nice male, double kiped uh, brown trout caught uh, last year. It was just a gorgeous fish. And like all uh, trout species in landlocked salmon at the DSR, we released them. 
Uh, just one thing when you're when you are going to release a fish and, and I've noticed over the last few years people are really sensitive to catch and release and to do it correctly and I notice people watch me when I'm handling a fish on the river so when I take a guest down and and, and we know where we're going to want pictures I find out who has the camera and where it is and we don't take the fish out of the water until that camera's ready. And we try to minimize the time out of the water. And a lot of times, uh, right now, I'm trying to get the guy to kneel with the net under the fish, keeping the mm -hmm. fish wet. You probably heard uh, that the, that organization, keep, keep them wet. That's, there's a lot of good advice. Cameras kill fish. If you're, if you're there alone and you're trying to get your own picture of that fish lying on the bank, you stand a good chance of injuring the fish. They are used to a neutrally buoyant environment. When you lay them on the bank and they start flopping around, yeah, you can release that fish and he looks all right, but that fish is good chance it's mortally injured. So it's just uh, just some uh, don't be that guy kind of advice. Another question, is the yeah. hatchery open? The... Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have uh, guests come up and they uh, stay at the Tailwater Lodge. And Tailwater Lodge designed those rooms so, so fishermen bring their spouses up. And that was a, uh, that, that's pretty popular with the spouses to go up to the hatchery. That and the, uh, the, the Salmon River Falls, which is just a, a few miles above the hatchery. Okay, we get the steelhead. Now, right now we're seeing a few steelhead. But... They don't really show up in numbers and you can't give a good date. To me, it's always been around, around the 20th of October, sometimes earlier, sometimes later. But it's based on salmon spawning and they're not spawning right now. And once you see them spawning and, and see that, that behavior and you see spawn on the staircase as you go up at Douglaston and the eggs, then you know the, the steelhead are going to show up in, in, in six to seven days. And I, to me, that's always been the key, six or seven days after the spawn. I think that's the time it takes for that, that scent to get out in the river plume and into the lake and steelhead for their uh, fall banquet. Okay, we have these uh, steelhead up in the river. The salmon are gone. We're into December, January. The water's cold. cold. We start going to uh, smaller patterns and less flash, uh, more natural patterns. Then in January, those eggs hatch. Salmon eggs hatch in 90 days. The reds are designed to hold the eggs in the red. And uh, the, then we have the elvins born. You see the elvins in the middle with the, with the big egg yolk and the prominent eyes and a little half inch silver translucent body. They have no movement either. So the red is designed to keep them in, but they do get washed out. So that little uh, fly at the top is a, is, a, is a really good fly for them. Now it takes them seven to 10 days to absorb that yolk. At that point in time, they're about a uh, three quarter inch long fingerling. And then we, you can change patterns. But uh, right around mid January, that, uh, that uh, uh, oven pattern is, is, you're really matching the hatch. Okay, here's a real cold day in the middle of January up in the lower fly zone. And uh, guys will still swing in the winter and they'll still catch fish, but these fish are, are not moving for a fly. That water's below 40 degrees, sometimes 34, 33 degrees, and it's hard to catch them. That's my favorite winter fly there. That's the red squirrel nymph. And uh, over the last five or 10 years, I, I, I use it more and more and more. And I like it because I don't know why it works. I've used soft tackles for years and this cer certainly fishes like a soft tackle, but it's really been a great fly for me. So. Uh, How big a the pattern is it? Well, you know, I get down to 14s when the water is uh, a standard is uh, say say mid-November and I'm not doing anything on flesh flies, I'll put it on a 10. 
And then as the water gets colder, I'll eventually go to a 12 and then to a, a 14. I know guys that fish 16s for uh, uh, flies as small as 16 for steelhead, but I, I've never gone that small for them. You know, I, I'm not sure if you can, you can get a strong enough hook for some of these guys, but I know guys that do, do fish for smaller, but as far as small as I go as a 14. That's good. That's a good fly. That's really, really, it's a great fly. A lot of different egg patterns up here. One thing about eggs is sometimes four or five different pair of salmon will use a red. So there's, boom, they start laying eggs. There's eggs available. The, the uh, steel hat really turned on. And uh, all of a sudden, the water level doesn't change. There's no more available eggs because they're, they're not enough current to wash it through. So you get off the egg patterns and you start with your stoneflies and your, your hare's ears and, and whatever. But all of a sudden, there's a quick raise in, in water levels and they'll start flushing eggs back down. You'll have another egg bite. So I think that's something to watch out for. Trout beads, a lot of fly fishermen don't like them. I carry them. I use them. Uh, it was a technique that started in Alaska and it started as a fly rod presentation. So, you know, it's an, and it's effective. You cannot use those in the fly zones though. Okay, uh, a lot of the egg patterns that you buy, especially the nice little round ones uh, are, are tied beautifully and they're, but they're tied really dense and they don't absorb water. A salmon egg is more dense in water. These fish see it, actually see it bouncing down the bottom. And so the commercial glow bug eggs don't get down like that. So I like the Y2K pattern because I think the way you tie it with egg yarn, it absorbs water the quickest and it gets down, but it's just anecdotal. But the, you've got to have that. They're not going to come 14 inches off the bottom for an egg. They may a, a, a nymph, but not an egg. That's, it's not natural. Do you ever tie any egg flies with the eggs to sea material? Yeah, that's great stuff. Yeah, and I'm hearing good stuff about that. I'm glad you said that. I have to I'll find that box. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. is that anyway? That was someone else asking. <laughs> it's, a, a, it's, a, it, it's a kind of a chenille with the fabric, but the fabric is just on a uh, 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 both sides, just two sides. I'm not trying to think of what it looks like. Uh, it's like a feather. The fabric is on uh, each side of the quill. Okay. And 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 and, and like a uh, like like when you're tying a hackle and you pull you as you wrap you pull it back so you don't bind it down. But it's a really easy material to work with and it makes a really good, good looking egg. I, I like that ecstasy a lot. I. I yeah, I'm glad you reminded me because I, I have never bought any. I got six or eight sample packs from a company and uh, I tied some up. I used them last year. I think they're good. Listen, we all have confidence flies. And if my, if my guest has a confidence fly and he doesn't have to use my flies, I want him to use that confidence fly because he's going to focus more on his presentation and, and, and uh, he's going to do better. So this is a confidence game. So the first adjustment I do as it gets cold is I go down from 12s. Uh, I go to more natural patterns, a lot less flesh. Early, late winter, early spring, uh, you know, they're gonna start spawning. Sp sp spawning with your, with your steelhead is based on water temperatures primarily. Some people say there's a moon phase, I, I, I don't know that. But when they start spawning, this is an exciting time because you've got pre-spawn fish, you've got the spawning fish that are, are, the females will drop back immediately, the males hang around a while, and you've got late fish that know they're late coming into the river to spawn. So uh, this uh, sometime in early March, mid-March, and the warm water picks up, so their aggression picks up and uh, they start spawning. And uh, it's a great, great time to to be on the river. Uh, leaving Salmon River for a bit, uh, I just did some work with an author on the uh, uh, Sandys. 
and uh, he, he wanted to know if we went to the Sandies, if it was the same as the uh, Salmon River. I said, well, I only go to the Sandies when Salmon River is too high to fish. But I said, no matter, uh, no matter what, the Sandies, the timing has to be very well because they're small waters. They have a small watershed. They rise and drop quickly. And uh, we, need yeah. we need to differentiate between the Sandies up north of the Salmon River and the one over by Rochester in Hilton. I didn't get that question, Ralph. I said we need to differentiate between the north oh, yeah, and the I'm sorry. By, yeah, by Pulaski yeah. versus yeah. the one in Hilton yeah. near us. Yeah, there's three Sandies here there's North <laughs> and Little Sandy. And they all are right in that area of, of uh, Lacona, Sandy Creek. And uh, they're, they're short watersheds, but they, uh, I was up there with, with this author last week and, and we did see some salmon, but uh, everybody was sight fishing. It was, I thought it was kind of a mess, but uh, uh, every time I try to hit the Sandies, I'm usually, I'm usually a few days late. Because uh, the, the timing there is so different. I'm going to start looking for spawning fish in the Salmon River mid-March. They'll start spawning in the Sandies at the uh, in, in, end of February some year. So just to, but if the Salmon River is too high, those Sandies have often fished very well. Okay, this is obviously a drop back. They've lost up to a third of their weight and their uh, or a quarter of their weight, excuse me. Spawning is a very physical and rigorous uh, event for these fish. Uh, in fact, some of them, even though they spawn four or five times, some of them don't survive spawning. In Salmon River, it's estimated that 80 to 85 percent survive spawning. And that's because it's a short river. They only have 15 miles to run. And there's a lot of food in Salmon River. There's a lot of food. On the West Coast, of course, they're making 600, 700 mile runs. They're dropping back. They've got to pass some dam barriers. And it's often their survival rate is, is less than 20%. So we're very fortunate to, to have the survival rate we do. Again, just some water levels are crucial. You know, don't come over here if it's over 25,000 CFS or 2,000 rather. Douglaston closes if it's over 2,000. And you can't fish safely without cleats. Uh, keep a look on the for weather forecast. The reason I say that is the dam that controls the water flow in Salmon River is only 164 acres. That's the lower reservoir. And if they have a heavy rain, that rain goes immediately into the way the topography is, it goes immediately into that. Uh, small reservoir and the the manager of that of that uh, facility cannot wait four or five or six hours to let water out the dec doesn't want them to wait to let water out because if it if we get high water and it starts to go over the outflow the safety mechanism it goes to the north a north channel that's usually dry and for some reason any water coming out of that north channel attracts a fish over there so, uh, and the water will go down quickly and then we'll have a lot of uh, landlocked fish over there. And I've been over there several times that with nets taking uh, steelhead out of those, what's left of those, of that uh, overflow back into the main stem. So uh, the, the manager of the dam does not go by rain. He has to go by the forecast because of that small reservoir. Also, guys will catch fish here in a spot. And they'll want to go back to that same spot the next year or whenever they return. Well, the water levels change all the time. And if you were knee deep and fishing a spot and you did good and you come back the next year and the, and the flow is 500 CFS higher, now you're at mid thigh. Well, that's not particularly safe. I won't let my guests go over knee deep and I don't go over knee deep to fish. And, uh, and those fish might be there because the higher the water level is, the closer to the edge these fish are. So it's always a good idea before you walk out into the stream to take a good look because these steelhead will feed in a foot of water. And uh, 
you know, if you go charge it in there, you've staled that hole for, for, for a while. So any of that, check the water before you go in. Oh, sugar. That's that bugger I wanted to show you with the, with the uh, multicolored tail. That's how I'm tying them now. And I, I think I'm having better luck, although I don't know. In the spring, when these fish are, are spawning and dropping back, they're active. Go big, go visible. These drop backs and these fresh run fish will move for a fly. So, uh, you know, and again, presentation is more important than, than pattern. They will come up off the bottom now. Swinging is probably the most effective technique because you're covering a lot of water. You're going to present the more active fish, and that's a great way to, way to catch them. You can still catch them on egg patterns and, and, and stoneflies and, and, and nymphs, but uh, it's a great time to get out those intruders and have at it. Okay, there's again another good look at a spawned out uh, kelp. Oh, I used that picture twice. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> but we already talked about the, they're losing their weight, how easy they are to ID, ID and, and how uh, aggressive they are. Temperatures are rising in the water, so their metabolism is rising. All right, there we go. Uh, now, the landlocked salmon, and this is a native fish, and we see them every year, and sometimes we see some big ones. Uh, the state is trying to uh, reintroduce this native species. They've been trying to do it since the 90s. I've read the studies, both the Canadian and the New York study on reintroducing these species. And the biggest wicket they had to overcome was the alewife in the lake. The alewife is an invasive species that got here in 1870. It has thiaminase in its skin. Our native fish, the landlocked salmon and the lake trout, do not tolerate the thiaminase. And so uh, if they are feeding exclusively on alewives, they'll build up the thiaminase in the body. They will not be able to absorb thiamin B1 and they will not be able to, uh, to produce energy metabolism. So it does three things. It weakens their eggshells. It creates a central nervous disorder or it, does, it, it creates early mortality syndrome. Five years ago on Salmon River, for what, some reason it affected steelhead. And we, I think we lost 50, 60% of our steelhead population over two years. The lake had frozen over twice, first time in 100 years it froze over once. The DEC thinks it isolated steelhead with uh, the uh, alewives, pressured alewives. If the alewife is pressured or stressed, it produces more thiamine. They flew fed exclusively on these uh, stressed alewives and they got the early mortality syndrome. When you go down, you get in the water and you start fishing, and you'd see this fish pointed upstream that could not make it upstream, kept backing up, not a mark on them, beautiful 12, 15 pound steelhead. And it took the DEC three, three months to react to the fact that it was, it was early mortality syndrome. So uh, now if those fish get to the hatchery, they give them B1 and it's, and it's cured. In, in fact, since 1988, every hatchery that services the Great Lakes puts the eggs they're gonna, they're gonna raise in a thiamine bath. So uh, in any event, uh, we're having some problems based on DEC uh, trawls in the lake on alewives. So they cut salmon stocking 20%. This will be the fourth year. If that's true, and we know they're stocking the native bait fish, the Cisco, that may be a real step up for our, our landlocked salmon fishery. But there's been a number of them caught, probably more than uh, any year I've been here uh, this uh, this fall, and I've I've seen before. So maybe they'll be coming back. When we can predict these fish, they're 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 a June July spawner, so you really got to be lucky to to hit a pot of them when you come down here because they move up into the headwaters fairly quickly. But what I've noticed is, is that 
you get down to Douglas and Sam run and you take the water temperature in April and it's 50 degrees, you are going to see a landlocked salmon. And these fish here are all uh, from all 50 degrees in the spring. In fact, Ralph and I, and, and I got a picture of, of Dave in here with this beautiful landlock. And we went down the river that day and I took the, yeah, there it is. And I took the temperature and it was 50 degrees. And uh, Dave got that one on a bugger. And that, see the thick, I've never seen one that thick. So I took the picture up to the, to the hatchery and I said, well, it couldn't be feeding on alewives to get that thick because it would, it would have problems. And they said, yeah, it, we think it's feeding on emerald shiners. So, or, you know, it could have been feeding on the gobies. The brown trout have adjusted to the gobies. And that makes sense because they're the most adaptable trout. Anyway, 50 degrees in the spring, uh, you're liable to see uh, landlocks here. Okay, the unexpected. Well, the common carp, uh, when they come up in the, in the spring, and uh, they'll, they'll come up when the steelhead are still in the river, there'll, there'll be a few, some steelhead. So we're still talking April. They will hit a woolly bugger. <laughs> we have caught some beautiful carp in the, in the in, at DSR with that. We see lake suckers. Every once in a while, they hook one of those. It's usually, usually foul hook, but I've, I've caught them on egg pattern. And then the gar come up to spawn. And we'll see gar, and we'll see gar snap on our flies. They're really hard to hook. But the smallmouth are interesting because we'd always had some smallmouth up on the river 10 years ago. But from 10 years on, every year, this, the fishery for smallmouth gets better and better. And they'll come up in the river in April, mid-April, and we'll see them until that river gets low. So if we have significant water through, uh, through the end of July, they'll be up here and, and, uh, then. And we're talking six, six, uh, seven pound fish sometimes. So we'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, so there's quite a variety up here. We have two varieties of summer run trout, the uh, landlocked salmon and the scamania steelhead. We have brook trout up on the tug. We do have resident browns in the river. Uh, we've been catching browns uh, 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 in the uh, upper fly zone in the summer. And uh, these are not the lake run, these are resident browns. Uh, Douglas used to stock browns and the, the DEC now, they don't do it anymore, but the DEC stocks browns. They're not on the schedule, but if they have leftover fish, they stock them at Pineville and at the, the 2A bridge. And uh, that can be a fun fishery. We've got some uh, largemouth uh, bass in the uh, estuary area of the river. And sometimes you'll catch one up in the uh, upper fly zone that's come somehow got out of the upper reservoir. So one of the things we look for in the summer is the water releases. They have uh, water releases for kayakers. There's six or seven on the weekends. And if there's fish, uh, out in the river plume and they're going to run that higher water will trigger a run so that's something to keep an eye on all right let's see here we go okay there's a very very nice small mouth that came out of the josh pool and uh that was uh around the 1st of June, so it wasn't quite seasoned. But we had walked down that shoreline below the angler, and we saw six or seven fish in a foot of water facing the shoreline. So what they're, what they're waiting for, if they're waiting for the small frogs from that time, at that time. So I had my buddy there put on a gurgler, and, and he got that one on a gurgler. So uh, early on, they're, they're susceptible to buggers and, and nymphs, and uh, uh, but once that water temperature heats up enough, poppers and gurglers work very well for them. And like I say, they can stay up till, uh, till late July before they go back. Uh, they're, if you're a, you, they don't hold in the same water the steelhead, obviously. They hold in the soft pockets and uh, it's, it's really kind of different fishing. I, can, I find them in shallow water all the time, but it is an absolutely fun fishery and there's very little pressure on these fish. And if you're up there, you get a shot at a landlocks or a scamania. So it's a really interesting fishery with significant fish. 
Okay, the schemanias. You notice here this the pec pec's gone, the pec's gone here. That's a that's the schemanias. Uh, this is a, uh, a wounded warrior from Maine. He got a beautiful uh, female, uh, uh, great fight, nice fish. And uh, that was on a bugger. I never saw a pecker roll since. Well, just one. And, okay. You know, the couple, they, they, they don't do that. That's a couple of years old. They stopped doing that tour. They're supposed to have stopped doing that two or three years ago because of what they decided was too much of a, of a, a too big a cost for the fish. There's a nice landlock. This is the head of the meadow pool. A uh, great place to fish for them in the spring. Uh, uh, with minimal flow, that's we always had a problem with the flow in the river because the river, when we started these salmon in the uh, in '68 and through the '70s and the '80s, the power companies had no. Uh, they were not going to take care of the river. Fishing was not something they were going to adjust the business for. Their businesses was to produce power. They had high capacity generators. And when the water was available, they, 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 they would uh, send it down until it wasn't available. And we'd have these very low water periods, which limited or, or, or just cut out natural reproduction. And it interrupted the bug's life cycle. So you know, it wasn't a buggy river. So they had to relicense those. It was a federal relicensing uh, program in 1996, and, this, and the federal government made the power company sit down with 26 different groups of stakeholders, kayakers, fishermen, environmentalists, and they had, to, they had to make a deal in order to keep their license. And what we have is three periods of the year where there's a minimum flow, a different minimum flow, flow for each one. The minimum flow in the summer is 185, and that's uh, adequate for natural reproduction of fish and for the, the in insect population. But I don't know if, you, if, if you've ever focused on these uh, landlocked salmon and ever caught one. It, it's a, just a magnificent fish. I just described to people as when you set the hook, you're already looking at him. He's aerial. He's out of the out of the water six or seven times the first 30 seconds. I think they're much faster than a steelhead and they certainly run further. So, uh, and, and they're just gorgeous, gorgeous, slender fish. So, beautiful fish. There's a one about 16 we caught in the meadow. I caught it on a hornbird. I was fishing, fishing for smallmouth and I was fishing the hornbird dry and you pop it under when, you, when it gets to the, when it starts to drag. And that fish exploded on it. So, something I'll never forget. I just put this in here. This is a buddy of mine with an actual Atlantic salmon, and, and there's really no difference in their in their in what they look like. Okay, we have the brook rainbow brown trout up here. Like I say, the state does stock browns uh, in in the river. And uh, I think the uh, brook trout fishing is getting better and better up on the Tug Hill. It doesn't get any really a lot of pressure because you got a lot of these creeks you got to walk in to to, uh, to get to them. But uh, I've caught them in behind beaver dams up there and trickles that are two feet wide. And, and there's a lot of water up there. But uh, last time I went to the Mad River, I think we walked eight miles and caught one. But it, it was a pretty day. It was a beautiful place to fish. We got some bass fishing, uh, both reservoirs. Uh, the upper reservoir has largemouth and smallmouth, and both of them have large smallmouth in it. Uh, there's crappies in those, uh, those reservoirs, and I never saw so many rock bass in my life as in the upper reservoir. It's unbelievable. It's it, 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 Ralph got a walleye and a fly, darn right, yeah. And uh, I, I'd like to do that again, but uh, yeah, they'll run up the, uh, the, the upper and lower reservoir are dams on Salmon River. You get to the, the top of the, the far eastern portion of the upper reservoir, there's two branches of Salmon River that come in. 
And if there's enough water, you can get a boat up into, uh, into both of them. And those walleye run up, run up in there along with the smallmouth to spawn. And uh, it's an interesting fishery. Okay, and then pending your questions, that, uh, that uh, is my presentation. And I appreciate your interest. Hey, Rock. Yeah. I got a question for you. On, on your slide 24, you had a salmon fly. Uh, I wanted to know what salmon fly that was. And you've shown these two tone tailed uh, bully buggers. How do you tie those? The, the, the double tail? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, it's just two separate clumps of marabou or, or third clump. Yeah, yeah. And what's the salmon fly? Oh, you know, I don't know what that is. I tell you what, I, I put it in there because it was pretty. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay, all right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, the uh, I tell you, I, I, I should have put a picture of this bugger in there and I haven't. I, I uh, Years ago, I tied a, uh, a, a bugger with a red body and uh, a olive tail on the bottom and a red a red marabou on top and a uh, white and black hackle and i called it the bad santa and <laughs> what, whatever reason that has been a very good fly i tie it with a bead without it and uh it is and it, it's one of my confidence flies i'm not using it right now because the Salmon River, for some reason, has been dirty the last few weeks, but I use it when it's very clear. And, and of course, reds, I think reds are real triggering color. I, How do we, Tim, Tim Flagler, in the latest version of, of Mid Current, has got a two tone tail woolly bugger. Yeah. But uh, when I tie egg patterns, a lot of times I tie them with red thread. You're trying to tie a translucent egg pattern so that and, and that red will show through when it gets wet. And that's, you know, it's anecdotal. Who knows if it works? But again, if you have more confidence in that fly, you're going to fish it better. I had a question from the chat from David. Uh, he's going to the salmon this week. He says, what fly and color to use around the glide area on the DSR? All right. I pick colors based on the clarity of the water and the amount of sunlight. I always start, whenever I take a guest on that river, if I go myself and I'm going down there early and it's been an early bite, it tapers off after 10 o'clock. So uh, sometimes there'll be a, a, a secondary run later in the day, but the, this year for the last three or four weeks, it's been an early morning bite has been the best. Uh, but uh, I'm so I'm going to put on a chartreuse fly. I'm going to tie on a chartreuse egg pattern, or I'm going to tie on a, a chartreuse egg sucking leaf. And uh, chartreuse can hold up all day, even if it's even if it's a bright day. But usually when it gets nine o'clock, nine thirty, I look up. There's no clouds. I got a bluebird sky. Then I start going to my pinks. And I might go if that's not working. I may go to an orange. But I'm I'm, I'm always uh, changing colors based on light and water clarity. So like I say, the water is, seems to be dirty right now. So I would start with, with chartreuse and it's 10 o'clock, you get out a lot of light, I start going to pinks and then the oranges or, you know, and then we go out, you know, Sam River's famous for blue. So, uh, so you can try blue. But again, it's presentation over pattern. It's gotta be down there near the bottom, and it's got to be drifting naturally. And if it gets in front of their face, they're going to slot it. Well, that answered it. Yeah, I think it did. I got to thank you. <laughs> so. OK. Hey, Rock, it's Ralph again. I think that you're seeing up in the salmon particularly later season, more natural patterns, or maybe even not more natural, but certainly more nymph type patterns um, than what we've traditionally been using. Is that right? Yeah. 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 
Yeah, just you know, the standard standard uh, uh, adapt uh, the standard way to adapt if you're not catching fish is usually to go smaller. Right. I have another question from Dave. Um, uh, do you wade or use a drift boat for steelhead in the winter? I I, I never had a drift boat. Uh, and I'm a fitness nut, and I would love to have a, a drift boat, but I don't like to, it's crowded up there. I don't like the behavior with the guides, a lot of the guides. And I always feel like I'm impinging. If I come into a pool and there's a couple of guys fishing it, even though I'm not interfering with them, I just don't feel comfortable. So I never got a drift boat. I do drift it. Uh, there's a couple of guys that are really good. Uh, there's a guy named uh, uh, Chris Curry out of Pineville and Rick Smith out of Pineville Sports Shop, a real gentleman. Chris is a wounded Marine. Uh, they'll, they'll keep the stress low and, and they'll put you on fish. They're, they're just real, real gentlemen. I, I really love to fish with them. They're great guys. But it's a great way to see the river. If you've never taken a drift boat, it, you really, it's some of the prettiest days I've had on the river is 30, 32 degrees, big snowflakes coming down in backdrop of the, of the pine woods. It's just, and, and you're gonna, you know, it's a great way to catch fish. What about in the, in the summer? What's the kind of the, the forage, um, you know, for fish in the river in the, in yeah. the summer? Well, it's an insect laden river because of these salmon carcasses. So, you know, your crawdads and your nymphs, I mean, there's a tremendous amount. Uh, it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of bait fish. There's a lot of bait fish in the river. So, uh, I, you know, I don't turn over rocks up here because if, if I am fishing for brown trout, I'm, I'm, I'm probably fishing for stock fish. Uh, the, uh, I tend to fish uh, top water whenever I can. So for the smallmouth, I'm fishing guard side gurglers a lot. I fish, I like to fish poppers, but the gurgler I like because when it swings, you got a shot at the landline. So uh, I fish a lot of gurglers in the summer. And of course, you know, a, a bugger is good for smallmouth too. How was it this past summer? Because it was uh, we had more rain than. than yeah, it was. It was. It, it was. They stayed. The, the large bass stayed up in the river a long time. Yeah, I had some really good days down there, and I was able to fish different parts of the river. Usually, I didn't have enough. I don't have enough time to just get down the stair steps at VSR and fish. But I got to go up in the top of this of the river. And, now those smallmouth will, will leave, they'll go all the way up to the fly zone. They're 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 uh, they'll spread out over the river. A lot of guys fish for them upstream. You do really do have concentrations of them at the DSR. Where are the access points for the the two reservoirs? Or um... yeah, okay, you. you uh, Drive past the hatchery for the lower reservoir. And uh, of course, just past the hatchery, there's two parking spots for the, the, the river below the, the dam. But you stay on that road and you'll cross the river. The uh, lower reservoir will be on your left. And uh, just as you cross the first bridge, there's a dirt road to the left and you can go down there and fish. And they stock that lake with rainbows. So there's significant rainbows in it. And, and it's, so you're fishing the, the river as it goes in right there. If you wanna put a canoe in or a kayak, you go across the bridge and you continue and you take the first left as you cross the uh, second bridge. And within 300 meters, you'll be a, a little uh, unimproved launch site. And there's smallmouth in there and there's a, uh, you got a shot at rain. I've caught rainbows in there. Do they restrict uh, like motors? Boats no motors. There, no no motors, motors in lower, yeah. The upper uh, reservoir has two great uh, improved uh, 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 boat launches. One at Jackson Road, which is on the western end of the lake, and one in uh, 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 Redfield. 
Okay. Which is on the other end of the lake, the eastern end. Well, let's see. Dave had another question for uh, winter steelhead. Uh, do you recommend the the DSR or or the upper river? I, you know, I never go to the upper river for salmon because of the behavior. There's, and it's it's a problem. Uh, we got these uh, salmon from the De Department of Natural Resources in Michigan. They told the DEC, whatever you do, do not let snagging in the uh, system. You'll never get it out. And the DEC allowed snagging. Well, now we know what that means. That means granddad, his son, and his grandson on the bank of the river at, at Ellis Cove, all snagging, because that's what they learned. And uh, so they, they outlawed snagging years ago, but there's no enforcement. And even if there was a, a significant enforcement, it's not, it, it, the fines aren't enough. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is our economy here. We don't, there's no, no business gonna move in here, no matter how educated our population or how beautiful the area is, because the tax system will not incent business to come here. So we're right back in 1801 when, they, when the whole economy was based on the fish. The businesses are scared to death of any enforcement. So uh, even though right now those guys upstream, many, and I don't care how a guy fishes as long as he's legally fishing. But now we've got guys here that are camping out. They're bringing their own food, their own uh, their own beer, and they're you know they have no respect for the fish or the fishermen, and they're leaving trash all over. So you got to wait for that to, to chill and, and leave, and then then you can go up river. So I do go up river in the in the uh, in in the it, after the salmon season. Last year was a crowded. I never seen the river. The fly zones were crowded. Uh, probably uh, a factor from the COVID. People just wanted to get out of the house and they weren't working, they had time. I think this year is probably setting up the same way. So uh, I'm not gonna get up at 3.30 in the morning in, in February to fish the lower fly zone. So, and that's that's what was happening. But there's still places to fish uh, upriver without, you know, and you can, you're not gonna run into bad behavior. And, and uh, I tend to go to the DSR uh, because I live a mile from it, and you know I'm, I'm really familiar with the water. But yeah, I go upstream. Okay. okay. What about um, uh, people using uh, center pin rigs? Are they catching a lot of steelhead? Out of the well, I, they catch ten more to my one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Center pin, and, and, and I know a lot of center pinners, and, and I pick on them scandalously, but it's legal. They put as much thought into how they fish as I put into how I fish. And, uh, you know, it's just a deadly tech. Uh, the problem for the fly fisherman is a center pinner can start at the top of the DSR and he can spend 20, 15, 20 minutes on a pool and fish the whole pool and move on out to the next pool. And, and it's, he's going to find that pot of fish before I am. So, uh, you know, so it is. It is a deadly technique. It's legal. I pick on the guys, but you know, God bless them. Man, they, they found a way of fishing they like, and they're, you know, I don't see them throwing fish up on the bank and taking a jerking the hook out, kicking it back in the water. Hard to compete with a with a real egg sack too. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, uh, any other questions from our audience here? You can either uh, ask them or type them in the chat. Yeah, this is Dave, the guy asking questions. I was on the cat today <laughs> off Lake, on Lake Erie doing steelheading, and I feel like I'm the only fly, fly fisher guy. I'll like, normally when I'm there, it's all center pinners. Uh, obviously they get out of Colville, out of Hamburg, New York, but it just seems like, and I've talked, you know, I'm new to this, but everybody I talk to, yeah, I used to fly fish, but I just center pin because I can catch fish and I can't do that with fly fishing. So that being said, if everybody converts to center pinning, what happens to the mortality rate of all these fish being caught? Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I do see a great, uh, a real increase in uh, 
we saw a great increase in catch and release uh, 20 years ago. And now I see a great increase on, on people trying to doing better at, at catch and release, making sure the, the fish survive. So, uh, you know, it's a legal technique. I like to tie flies and, 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 and so, and my wife's not gonna tolerate an egg sack in the refrigerator. So. <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's, it's tough fishing behind a spinner spinner. It's just so effective. It, it, you know, I do, I, I, I learned from those guys though, you know, I, when I use indicators a lot for, st for, for steelhead, and I've changed the way I weight my indicators. So, yeah. How? So I'm not buying a center pin. <laughs> I think it gets down to a function of what you like to do and what makes you happy. Yeah. Well put, Ralph. Well put. Uh, yeah, I had another I, question. I talked, I talked to DSR guy a couple of year, about a year ago, and he gave me a story. This is just stories. He <laughs> said a few years ago, a father son team came with uh, for steelhead and they were center pinning and in four days they caught 98 of them now, obviously they released them but it's just like when you have that type of catch volume and then throw a 15 to 20 percent mortality rate on it yeah yeah it's not good yeah i mean i mean and, and and if you're out there and you caught 22 fish can you remember number nine you know <laughs> so yeah i i don't know what to tell you i, I but I know center pinners, and, and, and I know that they're catching 20 fish a day when I'm getting three hookups. Hookups or lands? Hookups. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't felt like coming home and shooting myself yet, so I'm, I'm tolerating it. <laughs> Rocky, what's the best way to, to get a hold of you? I had a question about uh, your contact. Should uh, uh, email or? Yeah, I, I, they can phone me or they can uh, send a uh, uh, e uh, email. I, uh, I, I'm not taking paying clients. I'm taking uh, friends, old guests, and I'm concentrating on uh, wounded warriors, healing waters, and uh, GIs from Fort Drum. And uh, we've got a healing waters trip uh, from Maine coming in 1st of May, 1st uh, of November. I found a benefactor that's going to, going to take over 70% of their costs. And, uh, and that's, that's, you'll never have a better, more appreciative guest than one of these wounded warriors or soldiers. It's just, uh, they're amazing. And, and uh, you're doing some good. So it sounds like you've got a semi-retired from the guiding business. And... Well, I'm, I'm 76 now, and, uh, and I'd like to finish a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but i'll help anybody I and mean, somebody needs help or they want to report on the river or they want to book a guide i'll tell them who the good guides are that's why in the intro i didn't tell him what i tell you what i really called him on his birthday <laughs> be nice ralph you got five dollars hanging out there I, I know yeah mr gar right <laughs> yeah, mr. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, if I can do anything for you guys, just let me know. Thanks, Rock. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ralph. You've been good to me. Okay. Uh, I think we're just about done there. Let's see. Dave had one more question. Let's see if I can sneak that in. <laughs> Any thoughts on, on a book for the Salmon River or on a book? Oh, a circus with too many clowns. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am working on a, uh, it, and this is a long-term lifetime project for me, and I hate to even say it, but I'm in the process, and I've got probably three more years to go on a book on uh, uh, the military's elite agent integration. And uh, I, I, that's kind of my focus, and that's, that's what uh, really keeps me busy. But I had never thought about. I, I had thought about write, writing one because there's so many funny things that happen here on the on the Salmon <laughs> River. In the universe, but, uh, but I'm I'm attempting to be an author, and some days I think I can, and in a lot of days I think I can't. <laughs> okay, real good. Well, thanks for uh, uh, joining us again, Rocky. It, it's always uh, great to have you. So uh, my pleasure. Yeah. No. Well. Uh, 
definitely got some thoughts here, especially for some of those off seasons that you wouldn't think about, like, uh, you know, yeah. you know, yeah. spring and summer, you know, we tend yeah. to just think of it as a, as a fall yeah. and winter fishery, but. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Okay. And thanks everyone who joined us tonight. Uh, had another great meeting. We're going to save the recording for this. And uh, for, if you want to watch it again, uh, just check it out on YouTube. So. Great thanks, job, Ryan. Out here. <laughs> okay, over and out now. Thanks, Rock. Yeah, my pleasure.